Welcome everybody uh, to this PhD defense by Christine Ingemann. Um, I have the honor of uh, being the chair of this event. Uh, I'm a professor at public health at the University of Southern Denmark. Uh, Christine has submitted her PhD thesis as a part of the requirement for the PhD degree. Uh, it's over here, uh, the green book over here. Um, and it's entitled, Putting Families and Local Professionals at the Heart of Implementation Research, a Community-Based Participatory Implementation Study on Greenland's Universal Par Parenting Program, MANU. Uh, and the supervisors for this dissertation has been Christina Viskumlutten Larsen from the Center of Public Health here in Greenland, the National Institute of Public Health and University of Southern Denmark. Co-supervisor has been Professor Siv Kuanmo, Faculty of Health Sciences, the Arctic University of Norway, who is also present here. Uh, and the second supervisor is Professor Tine Jönberg thompson National Institute of Public Health, University of Southern Denmark. It's lovely to have you all here. The PhD thesis has been assessed, assessed by a scientific committee, where I had the honor of serving as chair for this process. And the two external uh, evaluators were Professor Gitte Adler-Reimer, uh, University Rector here at University of Greenland, uh, and Professor Susan Chatwood, University of Alberta, Canada. And Susan is joining us online today. Um, so we will hear and see her later. So for this oral defense uh, is actually uh, an examination, although, of course, uh, it's a dialogue and a debate as well. Um, but um, there are certain rules <laughs> to regulate it, and one of the rules is that the door is closed. Clement is going to close and even lock it, so you can't get out for the next two hours. Um, and I also would like, please, uh, for all of you to turn off your cell phones and make sure um, they're silent. So uh, what's going to happen is that Ingelise is going to give us a, uh, oh, so I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> Christine is going to give us a presentation of her PhD project. And that will take um, no more than 45 minutes. And uh, even though I'm sure she's going to do a great job, I kindly ask you not to give her applause at this stage because it's sort of an exam. Then the second phase of the, of the defense is that uh, she will be examined by both external members of the committee. Uh, Gitte will take the first round of questions and Susan will follow with uh, her questions uh, online. When the committee has no further questions uh, and if there's still time within the two hours uh, limits, I will allow uh, questions from the audience so if some of you uh, should have a burning question, you might have the occasional chance to, um, to put it forward. Um, the session has to uh, be finalized by 4 p.m. After that, the assessment committee, um, we will leave this room to discuss the oral defense, and then the door will open. Uh, and you can all go out, um, but, but stick around, because we won't be gone for long. So we'll come back in here uh, and read our final conclusion of the evaluation of the PSD thesis. And then um, there, afterwards, there will be a reception. But right now, Christine, uh, it's your time to talk. Uh, so you're welcome to give your PhD lecture. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Yes. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, so I will present an overview of my PhD thesis um, with the title, as Charlotte already read it out, Putting Families and Local Professionals at the Heart of Implementation Research, a Qualitative Implementation Study on Greenland's Universal Parenting Program, MANU, Zero to One Year. I will, um, uh, I will first briefly present uh, the study context and my background, uh, which have led me to my research approach in this project. Um, then I will uh, present what MANU is, in case there are some people here who don't know what MANU is, and connect it to implementation research internationally and, uh, and especially in Greenland. Um, this will lead me to my objectives, 
and the methods that I've applied. And then I will use a good time on presenting my results and then touch upon discussion points and uh, implications, so uh, directions for future research and practice. So Galachli um, Nunad means Greenland in Greenlandic. Um, it's the largest island and least densely populated country in the world, and uh, with about uh, 56,000 uh, people. And the majority, close to 90%, are Inuit, and um, or you can also say ethnic Greenlanders. Greenland is a former Danish colony and gained home rule in 79, 1979 and self-rule in 2009, but it is still part of the Kingdom of Denmark. So through the colonization, uh, Greenland also adopted um, the Nordic welfare, <coughs> the Nordic model of social welfare. So that also applies to the healthcare system; that all healthcare services are free of charge. Um, and um, yeah, and in 1993, Greenland took over the uh, or took over the administration of the healthcare system. And back then, there were actually 16 health districts, so hospitals in each uh, 16 towns in Greenland. Um, but uh, in, uh, in a health reform in 2010, these were centralized to five regions. And these five regions are mapped here in the, on the map, where you have the uh, north community, or a north region, Avana, Disco, Kakata, Samosok, and uh, Guechlek. And in each of the regional hospitals, um, you have, that's where the midwives and public health nurses work, and, uh, and they are responsible for servicing the smaller towns and villages uh, within their region. And in Samosok, uh, so that's where Nuuk is, there you have the national hospital, which is kind of like the regional hospital for that region. But we have in Samosok on the east coast, in Tasilak, we also have a healthcare center, which, um, which also has midwives and public health nurses. <clears throat> yes, and who am I in this context? Um, so I was born and grew up in Germany. I have a Danish mother and a Norwegian father. I studied nursing in Denmark um, and only worked a few years as a nurse. Um, and then I took a master's degree in global health in, in the Netherlands. And it was when I, was, um, I had to decide on the topic, uh, what I wanted to write my master's thesis on, that I realized that as a Danish person, I actually don't know anything about Greenland. And I thought this would be a great opportunity to learn something about the country. And this is how I found uh, the Center for Public Health in Greenland, uh, of which uh, Christina is the head of the center. And um, so that was back in 2017. Um, and since then, I've been <coughs> evaluating. Um, or back then, I started out with evaluating the implementation of the public health program in Marit Datu. And, um, and uh, yeah, and have since then conducted research in Greenland. And in 2018, I've moved to, I moved to Nuuk first alone, and then uh, later I met my husband to be Miki, and uh, live here now with Miki and my son in Nuuk, our son in Nuuk. Um, so my approach always, also when I was a nurse and when I was doing my masters in research, is just um, I always wanted to do stuff that um, the things in research that people can apply and that is relevant to the community I'm trying, I'm looking into. Um, so that was beyond on other things, my motivation to apply a community-based participatory research approach. And in a community-based participatory research approach, the focus is on creating partnerships and building trust between the researchers and the community who ultimately are meant to gain from the research. <coughs> so building trust and building relationships takes time. So. Um, I'm very happy that, so officially my PhD project actually first started in 2019. But um, so I had like two years before that where I was able to learn about Greenland, get into understanding the context, um, but also building relationships with, uh, with relevant stakeholders. And in that time, so we already in 2017, that's when Manu's implementation was initiated we started a conversation with the Manu team about wouldn't it be interesting to follow the implementation with research, and they were very interested, and so that way we started conversations ongoingly with, um, with relevant stakeholders. And then this way we identified uh, relevant stakeholders and invited them to uh, form a reference group, a reference group that followed the whole PhD project. So the reference group was um, involved 
in uh, defining what the focus of the study should be of this PGE project. They um, were also included in discussing the methods and where we should collect data. They also took part in parts of the uh, data analysis, but especially also discussed the results and what we can learn from the results and how to apply them. I held in total six meetings with the reference group throughout my project, and which you can see here in the circles. And the, to give you an overview of my reference group, um, uh, I was been, I've been very lucky that from the nine members, um, there have always been nine members, six of them have been continuous throughout the process, so they were with me from the start. Um, there were always a representative from the Ministry of Health and from the Board of Health and Prevention. There has always been uh, one representative from the MENU team. We had a researcher and the head of Echlofik, the Center for Addiction um, Treatment in Greenland, Birgit Niklasen. Um, then we had um, a public health nurse and two midwives um, who uh, both have, they have, um, they work on a practitioner level, but also have uh, management positions and experience from outside of NUC. Um, and then we have two members from the, uh, from the municipality in South Greenland. And that's actually something that um, first was added later, because in the middle of the project, the reference group was also pointing out we're, we're missing the municipality perspective if we're talking cross-disciplinary and cross-sectoral collaboration. So, um, so they joined uh, the group in the middle of the project, or to the end. Yeah. <clears throat> so what is MANU? MANU is a universal parenting program. That means that it's offered to all expecting parents in Greenland. And uh, when parents become pregnant, both the mother and the father are invited to attend um, preparational group sessions prior to birth, uh, six times prior to birth, and three times after birth. And these sessions are typically facilitated by midwives and public health nurses. And the overall goal of Manu is to contribute to thriving families in Greenland. In the, in the sessions, parents are invited to reflect upon what kind of parents they want to be, and for example, reflect on what they want to pass on from their own childhood and what they do not want to pass on. Manu um, was developed in 2016, and, uh, and then in 2017, it, they uh, the program was disseminated um, nationally while providing introductory training to professionals. Um, the local implementation was then, so I'm, I'm very sorry saying it was very disseminated, and there were of course provided trainings, but then the local implementation was very much the responsibility of the individual uh, local professional to carry it out and to make sure that Manu is carried out locally. Um, the development team um, described that um, that they experienced that professionals had a great need to um, to have Greenlandic materials that they can work from. So that was also something that the Manu team was focused on to develop more Manu materials to help um, professionals. So a lot of there exists a lot of uh, different types of Manu materials. Um, there was no implementation strategy described uh, when the program was uh, developed. And that is as such not surprising, because many national initiatives lack solid implementation strategies, and large national initiatives uh, rarely build on uh, local resources and on local strength. And that is in Greenland the case, but also internationally the case. Um, and uh, something else that the, the, uh, the Manu team was very focused on was that Manu should be offered and carried out and whole Greenland as planned. So all nine sessions should be offered to everyone. That was important to them. And that is something called an implementation science, uh, implementation fidelity. And that is as such not a, not a wrong thing because we, in order to know, to be able to measure the effect afterwards, we need to know uh, what, why did it have an effect. And that, that we can know when we know that everyone has carried it out the same way. But that clashed with how the local context looked like, uh, because local professionals were not able to implement all nine sessions, and uh, and so they had to adapt it. And um, that was that was just a miscommunication and a clash between the Manu team at the central position and the local professionals um, on what should be done. <clears throat> but I will get into that a little bit later as well. 
Um, yes. Um, yeah. So therefore, because we um, in general also don't. So this is one of the first implementation studies in Greenland, um, and we do we talk a lot about that programs are sent out and that there are problems problems locally to implement them, but we actually haven't documented. We haven't uh, looked into it. So therefore, the study um, focused on um, on investigating and understanding what happens with local Im local implementation when national programs are ruled out, and then in this case, Manu. But what about the parents? This is a question one of the reference group members asked at our, our first uh, meeting, and we totally agreed on that, and that, well, what do parents actually think about Manu, and what is their experience with Manu? Um, so we, we quickly agreed that it is important to also investigate their perspective and, and include this. So the aim of this project was to study the local implementation of the parenting program Manu Zero to One Year and parents' experiences with the program in regard to expectations, needs, culture, and values. Um, the first paper that I wrote um, identifies the determinants that influence the implementation of Manu from a national perspective while its implementation was still underway and at its beginning, and that paper is published. The second paper investigates how parents' notions and experiences of parenthood are reflected and challenged in Manu. The paper is also published and available. And the third paper explores what meaningful relations parents see in their child's upbringing and how these relationships are shaped and to discuss how these perspectives compare with, um, with Manu's material and content. And that paper was actually just accepted two days ago. And uh, then the last paper, which is still under review, uh, looks then into the into how professionals uh, experience the implementation of Manu into their local context, including how they manage the requirement of program fidelity. And so the methods that I applied were uh, qualitative, and I prim primarily used uh, interviews. So all the stakeholders and professionals um, were interviewed in Danish and were interviewed by me. Um, and with the, the parent interviews, and then we also interviewed a few grandparents, um, this was a collaboration with my colleague uh, Elsa Jensen, who is a Greenlandic interviewer, and, uh, and most of the parents were actually interviewed in Greenlandic. So every parent got the choice of being interviewed in either Greenlandic or Danish. If they chose to be uh, interviewed in Greenlandic, then Elsa would conduct the full interview, but I would be present as well and obser observe the situation and, and be there. But I would actually first really know what they talked about when I had the transcribed and translated transcription afterwards. We also held uh, one sharing circle with fathers and observed um, Manu trainings, so the trainings where professionals were uh, trained or introduced to the materials and sessions with uh, parents. And then also I anal analyzed some documents. So first of all, mainly the documents on how Manu was initiated and developed, but of course also looked into Manu materials, what content is in them. Yes. So now I will <coughs> move on to my results. <coughs> so I have <coughs> divided the results up in, in three kind of like perspectives or overall topics. And the first one is parents' perspectives on parenthood and child rearing. <clears throat> and so, or I can start out with saying, so when we interviewed parents, there were two parts. The first part was initially meant more introductory, so parents were able to talk about, well, how was it becoming a parent, and what's important when we're bringing up our children. Um, and then the second part uh, was more about how do they experience Manu and um, what, um, and what do, you th do they think about the parenting program. So approaching parenthood is the first topic here. And um, while well, parenthood starts with the decision to become, parent, uh, uh, to become pregnant, or when they found out that they were pregnant to find out, okay, are we gonna keep the child or not? Um, and then, very to summarize it overall, when parents described uh, their transition to parenthood, they very much described it from going from a party life to a lifelong responsibility. And, uh, and this meant leaving a lot of friends behind, but they also described, well, the real friends they stayed. 
But here were also, of course, some parents, or not of course, but there were some parents who also actually struggled with some addiction, and the, the move of becoming pregnant, or be about to become a, uh, a parent, um, made them the choice that they got out of the addiction and took responsibility. And that leads to the last um, topic within this, being able to provide. So becoming a parent also made them interested in getting a better education, getting a better job. If they were living with their parents, they wanted to move out. They wanted to provide a, a good home for their child. Then there's Doriste uh, Samanek, security and care. Doriste Samanek in Danish is Trykhild. Um, and this, as such, is not a surprise. I mean, uh, ever all parents want to provide security and care for their children, um, and parents also describe this in various ways. But what was striking um, in my interviews is that all parents uh, connected this also to, and they want to have a home where no alcohol is allowed, a home where there's no alcohol, no addiction, no abuse. And many parents connected this to their own childhood, where they, in one degree or another, uh, has, have experienced this themselves. But also the uh, parents who have not experienced this in their own home, they have experienced it in, the, in their community. So that was still important for them to point out, this is not something that we want in our home. And um, to support this, I have a quote from a father. It's because it's the worst thing you can experience in your childhood. When parents get drunk, they change completely. It's the worst experience you can have. It is harsh and you feel uncertain. Then we also asked parents about, well, well, what is important? What values do you have in, in child rearing? And a way to, to interview them about that, and we discussed this with the reference group, was to have kind of like a, a circle diagram where they were able to put in uh, who, which family members or which p p persons in their life would be important for uh, the upbringing of their child. And um, of course, the child was in the middle, and the closest were the parents. But then, uh, in almost all, it was the grandparents who were next to it. And the grandparents were not just a support to the parents for practical support, but parents very much described that grandparents give pure love to, to the child. And this is something that the parents had experienced themselves, and something that they wanted to uh, make sure that child um, experiences as well. And then they had many other relations. And some parents also were actually surprised how many they actually wanted to have in their child's life when they were um, writing it out. Um, and all this sense of community was also described of like that it was important to gather, it was important to share meals together, to be together, to be in nature together. Um, and, uh, and here the grandparents played often the role of as a gathering point. And <clears throat> Here's a quote from a, from a mother. During my childhood, my grandmother was very present and played an important role in our family. We've been close in the family, but after my grandmother's death, the family fell apart even though we live in the same city. It is therefore limited how much my own daughter gets to experience this, because family members no longer visit as often as when I was little. And to this, I also want to connect that um, in, uh, in this case, there was also uh, within the family there was there were some addiction uh, issues, and um, so when the grandmother died, there was not really anyone who naturally took on um, this role as the gathering point. And then preparing for birth and parenthood. Now we're moving slightly towards Manu. Um, but what I want to point out here is that many parents described that listening to others was something that was important for them in order to prepare. So mothers would describe while well, talking to their own mother or grandmother or sisters or friends about birth and parenting and learning from them. Um, parents who have attended Manu sessions described that they really enjoyed that they were able to listen to other parents uh, in those sessions. But then there were the fathers. I only We only talked to 12 fathers, but the fathers had difficulties uh, to find a space where they could share their thoughts. And I brought a quote from, for this. I've missed talking to other fathers a lot for a while. Being able to contact other fathers who have children at my own daughter's age, just, <clears throat> just to be able to share with each other. I have missed that a lot. But we men are not always open. This is a challenge. It is not possible to contact anyone, even though I have a large family and my partner.
the, the second topic um, or perspective. So here I've combined parents and professionals' um, experiences with Manu, and they relate to the delivery of Manu. So first there's the format of Manu. Um, so the group dynamics and the skills that the facilitator have influence the experience. If there are good, good, uh, good group dynamics, it's also um, described by professionals, it's easier to facilitate the group. Um, but also the parents describe well, the facilitator skills also influence how we experience it, and that also influences if they will attend other menu sessions. Um, if everything in this is good and in place, and it's both the mother and the father who attend the sessions, then parents have described that Manu can really uh, provide a space to reflect for them, uh, away from their busy everyday life, and also uh, to reflect about things that they actually usually otherwise not wouldn't reflect about. But there's this challenge with including fathers. Um, often fathers are not attending these sessions. I remember one father telling me, well, there's one other father, and I didn't really click with him. So that was also not really the space where they could share. Um, yeah. Then there is Manu's content. Um, professionals <coughs> professionals uh, described that, or expressed that they're really happy that Manu looks really Greenlandic. It's beautiful material. But, um, but many um, professionals from outside Nuuk pointed out, well, but it's based on a city life context. And with that, they very much mean it's a Nuuk context. Nuuk is very different from the rest of the country. Um, so that is something to be uh, taken into account. And it also focuses very much on the nuclear family. The, it does also address the grandparents and the community, but it is focused on the nuclear, nuclear family. And, um, and parents also expressed that, well, it's nice to also have these reflections, but they actually expected to get more hands-on preparation. For example, some mentioned, uh, well, how to hold a baby and how to bathe the baby. And then there's accessing Manu. Um, so I also asked the parents who haven't attended Manu or who have only attended a few sessions, well, they didn't attend because, because of work or personal hindrances. But something that I can sum up from what they're saying is Manu is not really a priority to them. Um, and that already goes on to the next one because professionals expressed that those who really need it do not attend. So what I can kind of see within this is also, well, if we have those who really need it and they're not coming, they might have other priorities. And attending a parenting program might not be the, the top of their priority. Um, so we need to consider, okay, how um, are we going to make Manu accessible um, to everyone? And then we have professionals' perspectives on local implementation. There's uh, the context and organizational structures. And, um, and this very much relates to um, something that I also mentioned in the beginning of disseminating uh, initiatives, and Manu was disseminated, but resources for implementing it did not follow. Um, and there were local conditions that made it difficult to implement Manu locally. A quote by a professional, there were many practical things that were not discussed in the course. And most often the Manu team's response to questions related to this was, you will have to find out for yourself when you get back with your local managers. But when the local managers are not involved in Manu, then it is difficult for them to comprehend the extra resources needed to implement. Um, yes, and then they also addressed the high turnover. We know there's a high turnover in our healthcare system. Um, but that was also pointed out as a challenge. You've barely finished introducing the work to someone before they're already leaving again. So it's hard to create continuity in Manu. And this also relates to the fact that, at least back when I looked into Manu, Manu was very much placed on an individual midwife or a public health nurse. Um, prioritizing limited resources. So public health nurses and midwives on a daily basis have to prioritize their, uh, their tasks. Um, if we look at the midwife, there she has births to attend to and vulnerable families. So Manu just becomes a lower priority. Even though it is politically decided upon that this is something to be carried out, it, it's just on a daily basis, it becomes a lower priority. <coughs> As a 
as one uh, professional expresses here, instead of using a lot of resources on sitting with two parents who are doing well, I could have spent my time on the more vulnerable, vulnerable parents. And also regarding prioritizing limited resources, with Manu has, Manu has developed many materials and sent it out and really with good intentions and everything, but we see that also with other interventions. They're sent out and then it's expected for the locals to, to local professionals to implement it, but that actually creates intervention fatigue. <coughs> A pr professional describes here, then some new books are delivered. A lot of material that you have to administer, master and implement. It doesn't seem to come with any funds or introduction or anything. That's how I experience it. We just get sent a lot and my reaction is like, whew, I hardly dare to open that box because then I have to deal with it. And then professionals need for support and skills. For this one, I don't have a quote, but um, what, what the things are behind this is kind of builds on what I just described is the need, the support and understanding of how local professionals, what their working context is actually. Um, professionals really try to do what they can with Manu. They had to adapt it even though the Manu team wanted them to uh, implement it uh, fully, but locally what, that was not possible. And that was again kind of like a clash of understandings um, and, uh, and the local professionals did not feel themselves recognized and has influenced their motivation. So, concluding from, from, from these results overall is that we need to pay attention to the families and the local professionals. By putting families and local professionals at the heart of implementation research, interventions will more likely be culturally sensitive and increasingly, re increasingly relevant to local context. Potential barriers in implementation and adverse effects of an intervention could be addressed early on and likely be prevented. So if we would include, uh, and not just include, but involve families and local professionals from the very start, we can make sure that the program that we develop is relevant and that it, it's something that they actually need, or I'm not saying that Manu is not what's actually need, but we, we make sure that um, it is relevant. And, and also including local professionals uh, in order to understand, okay, how does it look locally, what is feasible and what is possible. And many of these barriers that I've uh, discovered, they could have been prevented if we would work in that way. <clears throat> in my uh, thesis, um, I have uh, some different discussion points and I will just touch upon them shortly. So first, as I just now also pointed out several times, <laughs> their national programs are disconne disconnected from local context. So we need to pay more attention to the local context and work more bottom up. And under this uh, point, I'm also... <laughs> it was good to get some uh, spoken back to me. <laughs> um, no, another topic that I discuss underneath here is um, um, the fact that Manu is universal. Uh, it's a universal program, and this is also something that we have to think of. So. Um, Universal, universal programs does not mean if one size fits all. It doesn't mean that uh, we have to provide everyone an equal access. Everyone has to have the same offer. Um, we should more think about equity in a way that um, we have to think of wh who are the different parents, what needs do they have, what means do they need in order to um, achieve or reach the same goals. And then the applicability of implementation frameworks. So I used uh, impl so implementation frameworks are all de developed within a, a Western context, and then I have also used uh, an implementation framework from the Western context and tried to apply it in an indigenous Arctic context. And I think that is something that we have to look more into. How like does it fit these frameworks, or that we're not just pasting something on? And what I come, uh, what I've concluded towards is that by applying a CBPR, so community-based participatory research approach, to the implementation research, we can make sure that it's, um, that it's relevant to the community. And I think this is something that we can do in indigenous Arctic uh, context, um, 
because then we make sure that we involve community in all aspects of implementation. Um, yeah, so future points for research. Um, one topic that I'm addressing is uh, advancing implementation research, and so that's pretty much what I've just said here. I think it would be relevant to look more into um, implementation research in the Arctic. Um, and what I've so far looked into, it seems like CB uh, CBPR approach or similar is a, uh, is a way forward. Um, then advancing circumpolar maternal and child health research. I think it's important that we, to a higher degree, can uh, reach out to each other. Are there other parenting programs in the Arctic region where populations are more similar to each other? Are there materials that we can share with each other and learn from each other? And um, <clears throat> monitoring the effectiveness of interventions in Greenland. And I think this is also very, very important. We. Um, have a lot of interventions that we uh, put into place, uh, just like also Manu, but we actually don't really have uh, the possibility to fully um, measure its effectiveness because of the way that we register data or are lacking to register data. So this is something we should look more into in the future. And then I make some um, recommendations for practice, but these recommendations are also very much still under its way. At the last meeting with the reference group, we discussed the recommendations, but I haven't fully formulated the final recommendations yet and approved them with the reference group. But um, one that I, I think I can mention here, uh, which applies internationally, is on the structural level. If we want fathers to um, play a bigger role in, in families and take part in, in child rearing, then we also have to give them the space. And that means both on a structural level, we have to make better conditions for them to take parental leave, um, and also for working conditions, workspace, uh, workplaces have to be more acceptable of, of fathers to, uh, to take the time for their children, and also within communities. Uh, talk about what is the modern, modern father today and what do we want our fathers to be. Yeah. Um, I want to thank all, um, all participants, parents and professionals who um, took part in the study and especially my reference group who has contributed, contributed a lot to this project. And a great thank you to Christina <laughs> who supported me very much and my co-supervisors Sue and uh, Tina and also thank you to the assessment board for assessing my research. Yes. <laughs>